High resolution color graphics. This land of high technology. The revolution in technology that made the information age possible. Those kids are not afraid of computers. Welcome to This Week in Retro for the week of September 21st, coming up on today's show. Play Pac-Man in the real world with Pac-Man Geo. The mystery of the village broadband. Mist is getting a VR remake. And the console wars are back again. All this and more on This Week in Retro. Up-to-date news for out-of-date tech. Neil, now is a time of social distancing, as you know, but there is no law yet against running around outdoors with your eyes glued to your phone. (laughs) Two years out from the phenomenon that was Pokemon Go, the top brass at Namco Bandai have given the green light for a new AR game based on the first video game superstar, Pac-Man. This is Pac-Man Geo. Now, before we get into Pac-Man Geo, Neil, did you get into Pokemon Go back in the day or any of the other AR games that were hot in the pre-COVID times? (laughs) We're 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 using that now, are we? Pre-COVID times is a thing. Um, At the time, I owned a Nokia Windows phone. So uh, I think you can guess <laughs> Pokemon Boy. Go was not for me. Uh, and Talk it's fun- about the dark ages, Neil. Yeah, Come on, it, man. <laughs> I know, I know. And it's funny as well that you should mention this today because today the National Health Service trace and um, track and trace app has been released. And again, I, I own a Nokia, a 4G Nokia. I think, what is it? The banana phone. I can't remember the exact number. And of course, that's not compatible with the new track and trace app. So I'm in exactly the same position again today. (laughs) Do your part, Neil. Spend thousands of dollars on a useless smartphone. Come on. (laughs) So, you know, back back then, Neil, I, I experimented with Pokemon Go around town. But my favorite thing to do was to watch people playing this game because you could go to our local park and just see hordes of people grouped together and they're walking and they're talking. Of course, they're looking at their phones. But It was social, so it was so much different than normal Mm. phone-using behavior. Yeah, yeah. I was well aware of what was going on around me. Even though I didn't have the app, you just couldn't miss it. I mean, we all used our phones a lot back in, I think it was 2016 when this came out, but suddenly it was on another level. People weren't stopping to check something on their phone periodically. They were walking around with it held out in the strangest places, you know? Um, sober people outside of a kebab shop at midnight <laughs> you know you people you just wouldn't expect in the places you wouldn't expect and it all came back to this pokemon go it was a really odd time yeah yeah and so i wonder if lightning can strike twice with this pac-man game this pac-man geo um what this does and there's there's very limited amount of information released so far on this but it seems to allow players to pick up all the virtual dots in real world mazes so you either will have uh, pre-generated mazes based on roadmap data or sidewalk data or you could even have mazes that are created by the community um I would imagine that you would probably have power pellets that would let you, you know, power up and and eat ghosts as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that this could be a big hit because you've already got pre-made areas where mazes can be made. Uh, You've got trails in the parks or sidewalks or even in open fields. You know, somebody could trace out a map just by going over it on their phone and um, and then people could play that all day long. I think the, the the problem is 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 the problem with everything on online. You've got to stop the trolls from leading a maze out into the open street. You know where where kids could get hit by cars and stuff like that. That's no good. Uh, but I think that there is potential here. Neil, are there some places nearby your house where you think it, there would be a, a good potential for a, a real world Pac Man maze? Oh, there are some beautiful places around here. Uh, which could be used. Do you know what? I'm thinking about this. I'm pretty sure some time back there was a sat nav system that used the kind of Pac Man pellet system where you drive your car trying to eat the pellets to get to your destination. I remember that too. Do you remember yeah. that? Yeah. 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 But um, yeah, on the whole, I would say, can you please create the mazes anywhere except for where I need to be? <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'd like the most. Um, but, you know, seriously, I think if you create a game that's able to break down the social mobility norms and then use it to send people to places that they might not normally discover national parks, beauty spots um, to the steps of a museum, uh, you know, so that they might be encouraged to enter and have a look around that sort of thing. I think that's how it works best. But, you know, if we take a step back for a moment now, if there's one thing the world doesn't need is an app that encourages people to go outside and travel around a lot. So uh, I'm assuming this isn't slated for release until we're out of the woods with the, the big C. 
I, I think you're probably right. I think that they are dangling out this uh, this app out there as, as a reward for good behavior, for sticking to all of our social distancing norms and, and regulations that the government has put in place. But um, there really is not a whole lot of information about this. So we'll probably revisit this a little bit later on down the line when it becomes more of a real thing. Uh, you can click on the link if you want to see the pictures that, that Bandai, Bandai Namco has released. And uh, of course, want to thank Paul, a.k.a. Hermsky, for for submitting the story to our subreddit. A story that's caught the imagination of the press this week was submitted to our subreddit by Soid Madrid, thank you, and it's all about the mystery of a village that kept losing its broadband. The uh, The story goes to a village of Aberhausen, I hope I'm saying that correctly, in Wales, and it's 400 residents who have undergone 18 months of engineer visits, replacement cables, all sorts has gone on there to try and solve out what sort of why their broadband keeps going down and it seemed to be happening without fail at 7 a.m every day now uh, broadband engineers finally figured out what it was any any guesses you want to throw out there john what, what might be taking down a whole village's broadband you know if i hadn't read this story before i would have oh, no you know idea <laughs> what could have been i mean obviously any sort of electrical interference but a whole village what mm. what can possibly exist in a single home so tell me neil what is it <laughs> <laughs> well, the engineers paced around the village with a spectrum analyzer and detected bursts of electrical interference coming from an elderly couple's house. And they discovered that this couple turn on their old CRT television. That's the retro link. There had to be a retro side to this story somewhere <laughs> every morning at 7 a.m. And it was putting out enough electrical noise to screw with the entire village's broadband infrastructure. The embarrassed couple said that they didn't want the village to know who they were. <laughs> I don't think you would, would you? And they no. threw threw the TV in the bin. Uh, yeah, in a village of 400 people, I'm pretty sure rumors will, will spread and they'll know who that is. But um, I'd be mortified too, if that was me, to be honest, if I was causing that for everyone. But on the flip side, there must have been some really relieved broadband engineers to have got to the bottom of that one. That was not an easy job to get to the bottom of. Um, John, have you had to deal with any weirdness with tech like that in the past? You know, this is just so out there in terms of weirdness. Uh, I hope that one day that someone w did a little dumpster diving and, and fish that TV out <laughs> of the dumpster, because I feel like we could use that for, you know, counterinsurgency purposes in, <laughs> in other countries. We, if we want to bring down, you know, uh, the, the CCP's network or something like that, we should just airdrop that television uh, past enemy lines. Um <laughs> Any examples of me and tech uh, going south are always down to my own incompetence, Neil. Uh, I've exploded more expensive pieces of vintage tech than I care to recall. Uh, I've, I've plugged a 9-volt spectrum power supply into a 5-volt open-source scan converter in a moment of weakness. Mm. Uh, I tend to drop pieces of metal on exposed running circuit boards. Uh, I've done that a couple times. And and when it comes to polarity, when you're powering something, I just I just ignore it. So, oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm my own work worst enemy neil i don't i don't need uh, outside influence to uh, to ruin my tech <laughs> yeah forgetting the polarity check that that's a big one uh i i do do that quite a lot um i think another one we all experience is the microwave oven do you have this problem when you turn it on it kills the wi-fi connection for everyone in the house I have never had that happen have before, that. but maybe it's because I live in such a palatial estate here in the United States where everyone lives in mansions <laughs> and my microwave is just so far away from my from my internet connecting devices. Is that really something that happens? No, oh, it is. It is for me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, the, the price of houses in America. I mean, your microwave probably has its own room. That's just That's true. It is it's, over it's the microwave room yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with a Faraday cage around it. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I remember that probably the trickiest one I came across was a customer I was looking after who had a satellite office on a holiday park, and it kept that office kept losing its connection to the servers back at the the main office, and I tried everything. I was packet sniffing. I was testing the network. I was installing firmware updates on all the hardware. I was at a complete loss as to why it was going down. And then one day I was sipping my coffee outside, looking to the sky for answers. When a delivery truck arrived and parked in front of the line of sight equipment, which linked the two offices up, that was it. That was wow. it. Every day, the delivery truck would come and just park <laughs> in between Unbelievable. the line of sight. Unbelievable. So <laughs> the solution to that was a longer pole to get right, the line right. of sight up Simple. higher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um you know sometimes these things also work to your advantage when i was a kid i had a crt a portable crt tv in my bedroom hooked up to my amiga 
and that would be interfered by um, with by passing taxi radios. So you'd hear them chattering as they drove past. It was a bit annoying. It would interfere with the picture, and then they would disappear off up the road. But also police radios. And my dad was a police officer. So as he drove down our street and radioed in to say he was taking his meal break, I'd hear it and know, turn off the bedroom lights, pretend I'd been in bed for hours <laughs> and get away wow. with it every you, time. Yeah, it was brilliant. <laughs> did you ever tell him about that? Oh, yeah, yeah. L- later on, I did tell him, but mm-hmm. I used it to my advantage for a long time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> so anyway, if you want to take down your local area's broadband, just give a CRT a shake and turn it on and enjoy the carnage that follows. Neil, 2020 has been, by all accounts, a pretty horrible year, unless unless you happen to be a missed fan. Uh, in July, there was a successful Kickstarter that uh, came about before we started the show, or I'm sure we would have covered it. It raised $260,000 for a documentary based on the game. Uh, there's a TV series in development right now that's going to premiere on Hulu that is missed based And of course, we covered the Apple II demake of Mist on one of our earlier episodes. So if you're a fan of Mist, the hits just keep on coming. The original developers of this game, Cyan Worlds, have announced that they've completely reimagined Mist for modern systems. If there's anything that I hate more, it's corporate jargon like completely reimagined. So we'll forgive that for now, including, <laughs> Neil, they're going to have virtual reality support via the Oculus Quest, which is super exciting to me because I was hot out of the gate pre-ordering a Quest when they became available last week. Neil, between this and the remake of Final Fantasy VII, it seems like developers are coming around on the idea of reimagining games, just as filmmakers have reimagined classic Mm -hmm. films like The Lion King and A Star is Born, while reaping huge financial rewards. Do you see this as a positive trend? Um, Well, before I say this, on the missed documentary itself, I did have a lovely email from Philip Shane, who's the guy who's making that uh, kickstarted documentary all he was doing was reaching out to say hello because he saw my book being kickstarted and just wanted to make a connection and he seems like a lovely guy oh okay um but i think when it comes to the game itself remaking the game not the documentary my first instinct is to shout gratuitous cash grab mm-hmm. because you know uh, well it would be lazy to shout that out in fact each project does have to be considered on its own merits. But in the case of Mist, that is what I think. Because we did have a game called Real Mist. I don't know if you've ever seen this. 20 years ago, this came out. And it was a real-time 3D version of the original Mist. And if you check it out on YouTube, it still holds up today. And that's because the original models that were used to render those Mist scenes were impressive at the time, those static scenes. But even then, they were a low polygon count, even though they were pre-rendered in comparison to you know modern day games today so that real mist game from 20 years ago manages to render a mist world that looks just like the pre-rendered original one and moves smoothly and puts you in that world so that exists it's already a thing which means a, a new mist remake would need to layer on even more detail into this world than was originally there i mean a lot more detail if it's going to look modern and to be played and uh, you know believed in vr Um, And then you risk losing the character of the original game if you're not careful, if you start layering on all of these things that weren't there. So in general, yes, I like seeing old games reimagined. But in the case of Myst specifically, it's had five sequels. It's had remakes. It's got that real Myst. I think the horse is well and truly flogged, John. What do you think? Well, you've sort of talked me out of it, Neil. <laughs> I was excited until I heard your rebuttal. And now I now I feel like, well, maybe this is a waste of time. Um, in general, I'm a fan of reimagining games because I feel like th- a lot of games from the past really have stellar ideas and concepts, but were hamstrung by creaky UI or, or graphics that haven't quite stood the test of time. I think the UI thing is an even bigger uh, problem mm-hmm. in a lot of classic games than the than the graphics. Uh, I you know we cover a lot of Amiga Amiga games on uh, the Amigos podcast, and so many times I think, boy, this game it looks great. It plays great, but the interaction between the mouse and the keyboard and and what you're supposed to be doing just doesn't hold up compared to all the advances that we've had over the past 25 years. What was that system that that we got all of these games out on? Was it Macromedia? 
Flash, it wasn't Flash, was it? That there was a system that we suddenly had a whole ton of multimedia games came out on, and you could always oh, yeah. tell, couldn't you? You could always tell it was made in that system. They all had that same engine running on it. It was like mm. the Unreal Engine for CD-ROM games yeah, in the exactly. early '90s. <laughs> um, but I think that Mist is actually, I mean, aside from the fact that they've done this before, you know, with Real Mist, but I think it's it's a perfect case study for a reimagining because everybody recognizes certain scenes from the island. Uh, you know, the, it, it's a really iconic game graphically. And, um, you know, so many gamers have early CD-ROM memories of exploring the, what was at the time, a, a cutting edge photorealistic landscape. Um, but I, I don't know. I feel like the developers are playing this announcement pretty close to their chest. So maybe they're waiting to see what fans are reacting to saying, you know, and, and, and basing their development around that. I don't think that's such a bad idea to say, hey, we've got this idea and sort of turn it over to the fans without saying that you're going to be doing it and wait for feedback as you're developing the VR game. You know, what direction do would fans like to see it turn to? Um, I think that Real Mist is a good starting point, although, like you said, it is 20 years old. So I think there there mm. is room for improvement there. Um, one of the things that they announced is uh, that I thought was pretty exciting is they're saying that the game will have optional puzzle randomization. So, you know, the Achilles heel of games like Mist are once you solve the puzzles, there's no reason to go back and play the game. You've already you've already figured out what to do. If they can figure out a way to somehow procedurally generate puzzles within the game without making them too easy or too hard, it opens up endless replay possibilities. They just they just put the puzzle pieces back in the box and shake it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's it. And, and in which case, that would be very disappointing. <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see how this, you know, procedural generation is a double edged sword in gaming, as you know. So we'll see if it's done right or done wrong. Um, Neil, you knew this question was coming. If you could choose <laughs> any game to completely reimagine from the ground up, what would it be? Ooh, it's a tough question. By the way, going back to that macro media, was it Shockwave? Was that Shockwave, that's Shockwave. it. That's yeah, it, I yeah. That. Um, but yeah, if I had a VR remake of any game, uh, it would be a game that makes me soil my pants in pure fear at the thought of playing it because I get vertigo as soon as I go up more than three steps. Mm-hmm. But I like being taken out of my comfort zone and scared witless in video games. So I would have to have a VR game uh, reimagining of Stunt Car Racer. You imagine that Mul multiplayer in VR, so you're completely immersed in it with a steering wheel, and, and you're looking around on these roller coaster tracks. Oh, your breakfast wouldn't stay down. <laughs> It's funny you mentioned Stunt Car Racer because uh, I've played, I, I, I had an Oculus Rift for a hot minute before I, I sold it on. And um, even the demos where you are sitting and you are in sort of like a, uh, a slow moving vehicle as you traverse through various areas, even those, the sensation of movement while mm. seated and not feeling any physical momentum made me queasy. So if I if I was involved in any kind of VR experience in stuck car racer, it would be it would be <laughs> instant instant sickness. <laughs> yeah. I find the car the cars and the planes are fine. It's when you're in games where you're walking, where you're mm. you're moves you're sliding around when your body your your mind expects you to be walking. That's where I get queasy. But cars, I'm okay with. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I'm hoping. You know, I pre ordered the the quest too and i'm hoping that with some time i can train my brain to to not not feel as nauseous as i play because I, I know i'm missing out on a ton of great experiences um in terms of what i'd like to see um many of my favorite games i enjoy because they bring me back to like you know a particular time or a place and when you update the visuals or audio to modern equivalents it just becomes a different game altogether and uh, i've played countless games that are like you know a reimagining of X, you know, my favorite game or one of the games. And, I, and it's never been the same. So I think what I'd like to see is a reimagined version of uh, Frontier Elite 2, Neil. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. And but don't make it like Elite Dangerous because Elite Dangerous is already a game. Uh, they should do it like we, you know, we just saw Hot Shot Racing. We talked about that last week the retro inspired racing game where they kept the classic visuals, but they updated oh, the controls yeah. and the gameplay elements and everything like that. So make yeah. frontier, keep the flat shaded polygons, keep the colorful planets, the landing bases, all the things that actually, I think in a lot of ways make frontier a better game than elite dangerous, but have all of the mod cons that uh, elite dangerous brought to the table, I love including this, full, you know, yeah. full multiplayer, uh, HOTAS and VR support, all that stuff. Uh, I, boy, 
I would I would shell out for that immediately. I love this um, because it, it, it's not trying to be something it isn't. It's, it's, it's putting you back in the game that you remember. You know, it's, it's right. like it's actually putting you in that game that you remember as you remember it rather than a reimagining. Oh, I, I, I absolutely love this idea, John. All right. We're going to we're going to take this straight to the source. <laughs> um, you know, I guess I guess it really doesn't count as a reimagining because you're you're not really reimagining. But what you're doing is uh, there needs to be a new word, Neil, and I'm coining it right now. Good I'm it. coining it. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm not very good at coining words, but it's like it's like you're taking. <laughs> you can't carry on. We need a word now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're taking the rose colored glasses off, but you still. It's a rose colored contacts, Neil. That's what it is. There it is. Because you're taking off the rose colored glasses, but underneath you still got the rose color is on. But it's it's like the game is as you remember it, and it is real at the same time. Botanical reality. That's it. That's it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> That's what I love to see. And I, there are tons and tons and tons of games that are like this because everybody remembers playing games from when they were a kid. And everybody, nine times out of ten, when you fire it up, it's not as good as you remember because of X, Y, and Z. And so you can keep the core game, keep the graphics, keep the gameplay, but change X, Y, and Z, and boom, you've got a hit on your hands. So that is what I'd like to see in terms of my reimagining. Now, Let's talk about a, a a game that I think could use an actual reimagining in the style of um, of of Mist, and that is Silent Service. Cool. You and I, Neil, we both share a love of Silent Service, the Microprose Sid Meier submarine simulation. We do. In fact, a lot of Microprose games, you know, uh, and don't forget, we've also got that B seventeen Flying Fortress remake is in the works. So that's that's right up there now I think about it as a dream remake game for me. But yeah, Silent Service, good choice. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to see the original game reimagined for VR and sold and this is this is the killer feature right here. You you include a physical bank of submarine switches and controls Ooh. that are pre-rendered into the game. <laughs> so what you do is you put on your VR glasses and then you see the, the control bank, you know, you see the bank of controls just like you see your controllers in VR. And that way, you know, when you lower the periscope, you can actually lower it down. And when you flip the switches, you're flipping them in VR and in real life. That is the key to total immersion. Now, of course, this version of silent service would probably cost several thousand dollars, would never get off the ground. But in my mind, Neil, in my fantasy world, this would be what I'd do if I were going to be reimagining a game. Yeah, you need a silent service with all the flexibility of, say, a Microsoft Flight Simulator. So you don't need the VR. You can just build a room, John, and have a physical periscope that you look through to see the LCD screen. Now, now you're speaking my language. <laughs> <laughs> I may have to convert my microwave room, Neil. I'm not yeah, going to lie to yeah. you. And I'll just gently rock the room from the outside so you feel like you're <laughs> under the sea. So if you're a mister, wait a minute, that means something different. If you are a mist <laughs> fan and you want to keep up with this project, there's a landing page for this new reimagining on Steam, Oculus and GOG. I've got high hopes, Neil. John, hot on the heels of Netflix's high score, which we spoke about recently, we've got another retro gaming documentary coming our way. This time it's from CBS and it's called Console Wars. And it says in the Gump that it's all about the epic battle between two premier gaming machines of the 80s and the 90s from Sega and Nintendo. So this is a Mega Drive slash Genesis versus Super Nintendo documentary, which aims to pick the old scab of playground battles over which system was better. Have you seen the hype for this one, John? It's doing the rounds at the moment. I've got to say, you know, in my normal social media browsing, uh, this one hasn't come up to me uh, like like High Score did. Sure. I, I think I think maybe it's because I follow lots of like celebrity accounts on Facebook that are more in the timeline of of High Score. Like I know Trip Hawkins was pushing it pretty hard mm -hmm. on Facebook. Um, so I, I haven't seen that much about this one. Um, unlike the birth of the arcade game scene in the late 70s and early 80s, I was in my prime, as it were, for the console wars between the Mega Drive and the Super Nintendo, although nobody here, of course, knew what the Mega Drive was. <laughs> um, I, I don't feel any particular need to revisit that period of stupidity in my life. Uh, I was one of these kids that was a diehard Nintendo fan, and no matter what 
the the Genesis brought to the table, no matter how great its sports games were or anything like that, uh, or its arcade conversions, uh, you couldn't convince me that the Super Nintendo was better. And uh, as we all know, uh, hopefully, as, as adults, that every system brings something to the table. And if you can't see the good things in, uh, in systems that you didn't physically own, then uh, you're in the wrong hobby. Well, hmm. What do you think, Neil? <laughs> well, they're certainly pushing this playground battle angle uh, in the marketing. They're, they really are trying to push that. Um, it's interesting that the first thing you mentioned that you associated with the Mega Drive there was sports. So was that was it that quite pushed quite hard the, in the US? That was the killer app. That yeah. was the killer feature because uh, in America the Nintendo was so dominant. Uh, the 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 original in NES was so dominant. Uh, and uh, when the Genesis came out, especially before Sonic really took root, uh, the the sports ports of games like Madden, mm. uh, Sega's World Series Baseball series was huge. And I mean, these truly were killer apps because there was nothing on the Super Nintendo that could compete with sort of this these next gen sports titles, at least not for a while. Uh, FIFA games were the same way. The NHL games, all of them, all of the EA games were better on the Genesis. Yeah. Uh, why that is, I'm not completely sure, but um, that was definitely the killer feature that got lots of people to switch over because also, as uh, you know, NES fans were getting older into their teenage years, they became less enamored with uh, games like Mario and they wanted more multiplayer experiences. And of course, back then, the ultimate multiplayer games were sports games. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this this new series from CBS, Console Wars, is based on a book by Blake Harris, which he published in 2014 called Console Wars, Sega, Nintendo and the Battle That Defined a Generation. Um, its press release does talk about all the usual things. And we did see some of this. Uh, in the high school press releases as well. So things like the impact of E.T.'s failure on the Atari 2600 and everything that came about because of that. So I get the impression that it's a very U.S.-centric view. Yeah, um, here we go again. Here we go again, you know, a mainstream documentary. Uh, and I think these documentary makers are perhaps repeating history a little bit. You'll remember when YouTube started out, we got to see lots of retro enthusiasts who had very localized experiences of video gaming, you know, naturally, as they would. And then as time went on and we all saw each other's videos, we helped to get to know a more worldly view of retro gaming and understand things like, hey, yes, there was a video game crunch in the US at the time of E.T.'s failure. But in other parts of the world, like the UK with its ZX Spectrums, nobody noticed. It was business as usual. And I just worry that CBS are about to roll out these old tropes and make these same mistakes again, John. How about you? Well, TV networks don't think like we do. Um, mm. They think Netflix has a classic gaming documentary series. Uh, we need ours, too, you know, because we want people watching CBS All Access. So uh, it's all copycat stuff. And um, it's the YouTube folks, the YouTube retro folks are sort of a big fish in a small pond. No offense, Neil. And oh yeah, no. no. I, I, I don't think that I don't think that they're really moving the needle. I don't think anybody is watching LGR and saying, "Boy, you know, this is really interesting. We should build a series on retro games." I think it's more like, uh, you know, the Netflix series happened, pushed by all of the huge, huge names, you know, the the industry founders, and them saying, "What's what's a unique angle that we can spin?" I think that the bright side of this is that the success or failure of these two shows could spur on development of more retro gaming themed content on Netflix or CBS All Access or whatever. Um, the question is, where do they go from here? Um, telling the story of something, the history of something is good for one series. But once you've done that, what's left? And I feel like, again, I haven't seen this this new series yet, but part of the charm, as we talked about with High Score, is that they as much as it is a historical archive, it was told through personal stories of people. You know, when the Space Invaders guy came out and he was showing off his original notebooks and stuff like that. I mean, that was more than just talking about how, you know, Space Invaders caused a shortage of 100 yen coins or something like that. So um, maybe this can branch out. You know, it would be fantastic. What is the equivalent of what is the leading streaming service in the UK, Neil? 
Um, well, I mean, we've got the BBC's own iPlayer, which is mm-hmm. very popular, but Netflix and Amazon Prime are the two big ones that are up there. Okay, so yeah. it, there's not really... Okay, so let's just say the BBC. Say the BBC looks at the success of High Score and this playground or console wars, and they say, well, we need something just like that from a UK perspective. And, you know, it would be great if the copycat effect would actually lead us on to a more diversified view of retro gaming. Of course, being on iPlayer, it would be impossible for Americans to watch which would be a real bummer. But uh, I, I would love to see, you know, that effect sort of spur on other developments throughout the world uh, once they see that there is a viewing audience for something like that. You think there's a chance for something like that for my player, Neil? I think there are so many opportunities to do things like that. I mean, we used to have a TV show here in the UK called Tomorrow's World, which was all about the future of technology uh, and showing us all the prototypes and things like the Sinclair C5 when it came out and things like that. I think there is a huge gap in the market on the iPlayer for a program which I would call Yesterday's World. Mm, (laughs) It's the same format, but looking backwards at old technology and the effect that it's had in a a slightly dusty, old-fashioned, tweed jacket-wearing way. I'll put my hand up to present it if you want. I would love to see. (laughs) I I, I think that, that should be a thing. There are a couple documentaries that I remember seeing when I lived in England that that really left a lasting impression on me. And they were done by this presenter named Andrew Marr. Are you familiar with him? Oh, yes. He uh, is heavily involved with the BBC News. Uh, very knowledgeable chap. He had a stroke, I think, last year or the year before. Oh. So he was out of action for a while, but he is back now presenting again. So he's, he's done well to fight that. He did, he did a couple series on, there was one called The History of the Making of Modern Britain. And then there was a sequel. I think it was just called like The Reality of Modern Britain or something like that. But they were so well done. And I could see the BBC calling up one Neil, a.k.a. Retro Man Cave, and saying, Neil, <laughs> we need you to step outside, you know, open the door of the office of, of Ocean in Manchester and just walk down the stairs and start a monologue talking about, you oh. know, the, the, the history of, of micros in the UK. Uh, I think that you are the perfect host for something like this. Spread the word. Get the BBC researchers behind me and, <laughs> oh, I will read that script. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, oh, that's it. Uh, it just came out today, I guess, on CBS All Access. So, uh, you know, we'll both hope for the best and reserve judgment until uh, we've seen it. In the very least, just like High Score, it will hopefully engage a larger audience and get more people into retro gaming. Who knows, Neil? We might be pleasantly surprised by it. So, everybody, give it a try, and we'd love to hear what you think about it over on our This Week in Retro subreddit. So thank you for listening to This Week in Retro. Join our show subreddit and contribute your favorite stories from the world of retro. Help us spread the word about the show by leaving us a review on your podcast app of choice, sharing our Facebook page, or just telling a retro-loving friend. See you next week for more up-to-date news for out-of-date tech.